Vaporwave. When I first heard that term, I thought it was the most pretentious title used for anything that I've ever heard. I wondered, why would they pick that word? It doesn't even make any sense. That word doesn't even exist. Coincidentally, most people I mention this to always seem to have the same reaction. What the hell is Vaporwave? Well, let me begin. Vaporwave is a genre of music that originated on internet forums such as Tumblr and Reddit in the early 2010s. It distinctively has no set location as to where it originated, as it started online, making it the first genre of music to be completely globalized. It began as an aesthetic that was popularized by an obsession with 80s and 90s subculture, using glitch art, early digital graphic design, Roman busts, a fascination with tropical landscapes, Japanese culture, and of course, the redistribution of old 80s elevator music inspired from funk, new age, and smooth jazz. This all began in 2010, when two seemingly random albums with two distinctively different styles merged together to create what we now call Vaporwave. An experimental electronic artist, Daniel Lopatin, known by his pseudonym 10trickspointnever, released a humorous mixtape online under the alter ego Chuck Person with Echo Jams 1, a series of repetitive 80s hits that were slowed down and spliced apart usually repeating themselves on the same chorus throughout the entire song. It was described by Lopatin to be just a simple joke and was something he did just for fun. Regardless, it became a small internet sensation. Farside Virtual an electronic album created by James Ferraro used themes of globalization and internet culture as an influence to create this mellow, upbeat, digitalized ode to a rapidly changing world. These two drastically different styles merged together with a strange, largely unknown release titled Floral Shop in late 2011. strange synthesis of 80s soul and funk tunes slowed down, chopped up, and repackaged as a bizarre, eerie, droning sound that makes the listener easily uncomfortable. It quickly popularized making the artist Vectroid under the pseudonym Macintosh Plus, who was known already for having a large number of aliases for several other independent releases, gather a small niche market for anyone who liked bizarre 80s elevator music. One song in particular garnered a lot of praise and popularity and was the esteem Risafranco no Comunyak Tingo 420 slash Gende, or translated into English, Computing of Lisa Frank 420 slash Contemporary, which features a slowed down Diana Ross song, It's Your Move, droning on the misheard lyrics of It's All in Your Head, repeated multiple times over the course of seven minutes. Do you understand? I first listened to Floral Shop in 2014. At this point, Vaporwave was still mostly unknown to mainstream audiences, and it still is in current times. I first thought of this as a humorous gag, something that wouldn't necessarily last for all too long in the music world. It was essentially a joke on music itself. It literally was a glorification of stealing other people's art and marketing it under something else with foreign languages. After observing the underground movement and noticing 15-year-olds finding old obscure funk tunes to chop up and re-release under false names in Japanese, I then regarded the genre as genius. Going on Bandcamp and looking under the Vaporwave genre tag, you will find hundreds if not thousands of obscure, bizarre pieces of slow down stolen music, mostly made by young adolescents in the basements of their suburban homes all across the world. It has been described by some as a digital punk movement, with ideals that counter most national concepts of ownership by making Vaporwave an anonymous art for anonymous people. 
I wouldn't think much of the genre if it had died out the same year it was created, much like many internet crazes such as Sea Punk, Witch House, and others that existed during the same period. Vaporwave continued to grow, and has been for the past half decade, but the question is, why are people still making and still continually listening to this bizarre and seemingly uninspired genre? The word vaporwave itself is quite an anomaly. It is essentially the combination of vaporware, a business term to describe a product which is announced to the public but never actually released, and a Marxist term to describe a perpetual repetition of ideals which are not concrete or meaningful in their philosophy, described as waves of vapor. It is very pretentious, but that's essentially the root of where this all came from. A critique on modern capitalism. Great. In 2012, a producer under the pseudonym Internet Club released multiple albums that delved into this theme of capitalism with releases like Modern Business Collection and Vanishing Vision, all of which borrowed elements from Floral Shop to create a counterculture that, instead of rejecting corporate ideals, embraced them. This in turn sparked a new market by making Vaporwave's whole aesthetic approach based off a redistribution of old advertisements. The ideal for the genre continued to dominate the tone of most Vaporwave releases with notable artists such as Corp and others. This gave the genre a bad rap as it seemed to be stagnant in its development and was doomed to be an awkward phase of music which was shallow in meeting and production quality. Eventually, most releases were horribly put together messes just to undermine the true essence of what this genre was about. Most people had already given up on the genre by this point, and believe it to suffer the same fate that previous internet-born genres went through. The phrase, Vaporwave is dead, seemed to carry itself around on internet forums and continued onwards to be the perceived reality of what was to come for the genre. Vaporwave seemed doomed to die in a pit of irony and cynicism unless something changed. There had been a growing number of artists during 2012 and 2013 making albums mimicking the same sound of early vaporwave, but refraining from delving into the overused theme of capitalism and 80s nostalgia. These artists were mostly inspired from a largely underground producer under the alias Skeleton, who released his self-titled album in October of 2010. It was a collection of spooky, slowed-down songs that influenced a new wave of artists, all of which challenged the preconceived notion that Vaporwave only had one style and one overarching goal. They succeeded. Blank Banshee, a Canadian producer, redefined the genre by adding a trap influence. With a self-released album, Blank Banshee Zero, a remix of obscure New Age songs with trap beats and heavy bass drums. Infinity Frequencies, a Japanese producer who started making Vaporwave in mid-2012 with his first release Euphoria, is best known for his computer trilogy spanning from 2013 to 2014. The three albums titled Computer Death, Computer Decay, and Computer Afterlife are essentially a collection of strange, eerie, repetitive loops of elevator music. The off-putting sounds reflect a sense of emptiness and sterility, a reflection of the soulless existence of modern technology. Echo Virtual, a distinctively anonymous artist, made Atmospheres 1 in January of 2013, a whole album that combines samples and with completely original music that mimicked the sounds normally heard on a weather channel. Using slow, drawn-out melodies that were meant to be droning and uncomfortable for the listener. It grew in popularity, and the artist remained anonymous, stating that the whole appeal of Vaporwave is its use of remaining unknown, that in a world where nothing is private, it is refreshing to find something that feels like it was found in the dumpster of a thrift shop, where it does not matter where it came from or who made it, but only that it takes you elsewhere, somewhere distant from reality.
Unfortunately, this release was undermined by the growing size of meaningless 80s nostalgia until a largely unknown artist in early 2014, under the pseudonym Hong Kong Express, created a small band camp label with a 20 minute release titled Romantic Dream. <laughs> Described by the artist as a mysterious and romantic trip through the neon haze of a night in Hong Kong, a journey of subway carriages and fast cars, a love both lost and found, and a connection between souls. It was created to be intentionally melodramatic and cinematic, as well as being just a simple side project for a small time producer. It eventually became the catalyst that changed everything about what Vaporwave was. Dream Catalog, a record label that releases music with a philosophy that designates Vaporwave as not to be about irony or capitalism, but about telling a narrative through music. This revolutionized the way in which concept albums are created. In albums like Yes, We're Open by Groceries, we see a simple collection of sounds normally heard in a rundown grocery store, but changing them to tell a narrative of escapism and fantasy a cruel realization of hardships and monotony in a world that is constantly moving and changing. Dream Catalog currently has over 95 releases, all of which tell stories of melancholic dreams or escapism to a distant world, free of isolation and loneliness. The label has helped usher in a new wave of prolific artists that have been pushing the genre in a direction of positive growth, showcasing that Vaporwave is not dead, but simply reborn. Artists like Golden Living Room, an independent musician who is notable for creating slow, atmospheric ambient music with actual instruments, released Welcome Home on the label. In an interview with Hong Kong Express, he discusses the development of the album and states, I'm from the old school. All of my dreamy synths are recorded using a Yamaha DX7, Boss DD7, and a Fender Concert Series tube amp. I also have about five or six other Yamaha synths, plus a bunch of guitars and other random instruments like a sitar. Going back to trap influence Vaporwave, we see Vaporer, an underground producer who utilizes computer sounds as his drum kit to create ethereal, dreamy beats in a popular release titled Mana Pool in June of 2014. It pushed the boundaries of the genre into a more mainstream, conventional style that can be easily appreciated by casual listeners. All of these artists started something new in the Vaporwave movement. It was only natural for several popular releases trying to branch out and redefine the genre to be replicated by newer, less popular artists. This began a new wave of subgenres, all of which embracing the central idea of Vaporwave but focusing on only one particular aspect. Probably the most popular of the Vaporwave subgenres, Future Funk, originated in 2012 with several underground releases that mimicked a kind of upbeat, funky groove with a Vaporwave twist. It was heavily influenced by New Disco, bringing in a new style of futurism in contemporary music. It was officially branded as its own genre when a young producer under the alias Saint Pepsi released Hit Vibes in May of 2013. <laughs> collection of remixed 80s pop hits that were heavy on bass drums and repeated choruses, turning what was originally catchy soul tunes into energetic dance beats. This release quickly popularized, making Future Funk the new sound of Vaporwave. It spread to other artists such as Matt Cross 8299 who released Sailor Wave in December of 2013, a collection of Japanese disco songs remixed as a funky ode to Sailor Moon. Young Bay, a young producer originating from Portland, Oregon, released his sophomore album Bay in July of 2014, a collection of Japanese pop songs remixed with heavy drum and bass and a large amount of reverb.
On the flip side to Future Funk, there is Malsoff. It is essentially the glorification of utilizing elevator music as its main inspiration. It relies heavily on a lot of reverb and making the music feel a part of a certain diegesis for a certain location. It was deemed Malsoft because of the growing number of releases, particularly in 2013, of music sounded like it was recorded from a shopping mall. Disconscience released Hologram Plaza in April of 2013, a collection of droning 80s funk tunes with heavy reverb and an eerie treble reducer. This was the release that popularized the genre and made Malsoft a distinct branch of this vast art movement. In October of 2014, Corp released Paul Mamal, a similar rendition to Hologram Plaza but delving deeper into the soul-crushing reality of shopping mall consumerism, notable for being a good example of Vaporwave dealing with the theme of modern capitalism. Vanity, a producer known for several releases on Dream Catalog, released Plaza on the label in early 2015, a collection of drawn-out smooth jazz tunes, creating a sensation of late-night wandering, a journey through a desolate plaza all alone. A not-so-esteemed genre by casual Vaporwave listeners, but still important in the history of its creation. This subgenre was originally synthesized on subreddits by initially making a combination of C-punk and grunge music. Unfortunately, this category of music tended to be overwhelmed with cheap, ironic releases without much effort put into them. One album in particular, though, got some praise for its release on the business casual label and was Storm Memories by Sea Dogs in October of 2014. The effect is essentially digitalized noise to mimic the sounds of the ocean and of early 90s alternative rock similar to Sonic Youth or My Bloody Valentine. It puts the listener in a trance while simultaneously creating a bizarre droning sense of unease. It is not just the sounds of the ocean, but the very being of it. On August 16th, 2014, Dream Catalog released what is to be known as their most controversial release in their library. It was titled Floral Shop 2, and was produced by a then-unknown The Darkest Future. It was essentially an intentional mess of an album. <laughs> was a split decision between fans of the genre and resulted in many online debates about whether or not this album was complete shit or genius. Hong Kong Express later posted an explanation of the creation of this concept album by its creator, revealing to be Dark Pyramid, a producer on the Dream Catalog label known for releasing Electrical Teardrops and A Heart Full of Love, both of which dealing with the theme of android consciousness and love. In it, he mentions, Earlier this week, after exploring the new Vaporwave Ultra Guide that has been floating around online, I was listening to one of the recommended albums in the Classic section, namely New Deluxe Life. I was wondering to myself as I was listening, what is this shit? While Vaporwave can be very challenging at times, this album just seemed to push the boundaries of experimentation further out than I had ever heard within the genre before, to the point of becoming absolute crap, unlistenable. I wonder, do people like this album because they are truly interested in such inaccessible, challenging, and experimental music? This led to even further thought on the subject. How important is the aesthetic presentation to Vaporwave as a genre? Do we enjoy things more if it is presented with interesting imagery, and less so if it is presented with something that is aesthetically displeasing? The darkest future is the trend I see in music. As we head further into the abyss, Vaporwave at its core is ultimately not a form of music, but the first true post-music genre that has grown from being more than the tiniest niche into something of its own scene. While there have been other forms of post-music in the past, even decades ago, Vaporwave is the first scene of its kind to really take it to the next level to the point where someone like Vectroid receives high praise for slowing down a Diana Ross sample and creating weird-sounding loops out of it. 
What is innovative now is Vaporwave. Because of its presentation, the music becomes more than just a song and instead something larger than that. This is ultimately the next innovation in music, and people who say Vaporwave is dead are completely off base. I say instead that music is dead, and may Vaporwave continue to live. Whether or not you agree with him on his stance of music is irrelevant. What's important is that Vaporwave finally started to be conversed as not a new genre, but an art movement in general. In 2015, Hong Kong Express and frequent collaborator and co-owner of the Dream Catalog label Telepath, known for his ethereal dreamy releases, created 2814, a dystopian concept album with all original music using drawn-out piano chords, Blade Runner-esque synthesizers, and a heavy bass track. <laughs> This release has slowly become the essential Vaporwave album, hopefully taking over the role Floral Shop has dominated for several years, furthering that Vaporwave is not a joke, but a legitimate art form. To quote Hong Kong Express, he describes Vaporwave in these terms. Not every album has to be completely unique or have a heavy concept behind it, and I'm not against heavy sampling if it is done inventively, but if you're just treating Vaporwave as any other genre like house or drum and bass and trying to copy a formula because you think it has to be that way, then it shows a complete lack of inspiration. I think the most important thing to aim for in Vaporwave as a producer is to make something cinematic in effect. Make the listener feel inexplainable feelings, which is helped by the surreality of the music. Culture is so fast paced now that all this music is just passing noise disposable almost, and I like that aspect of it a lot. I love going on SoundCloud and just listening to the stream, knowing I may never hear these songs again, and they will just disappear into the wind.